Welcome to the third lecture in the history of ancient Rome. Having surveyed the introductory materials in the first two lectures, it's now time to turn our attention to the ancient world itself. What I intend to do in this lecture is set the situation uh, as it existed in pre-Roman Italy. Uh, the Romans were not the first people to inhabit the Italian peninsula. They weren't even the first people to become powerful or influential within the Italian peninsula. And it's worth uh, examining what the situation was that the Romans felt when they emerged as a major power in the region uh, in the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. I will begin by looking at the overall geography of the Italian peninsula and how it benefited uh, the, the ancient inhabitants there. And then we will examine uh, in sequence the uh, non-urbanized tribal cultures of pre-Roman Italy, the Greek colonists uh, in the southern part of Italy and in Sicily. We will treat them fairly briefly, mind you. And then we will look at the people who were often erroneously described as so oh, oh so mysterious, the Etruscans, who aren't really all that mysterious at all, as we'll see. First, however, the geography of the Italian peninsula um, as a whole. Italy is very well watered uh, because of its mountainous nature. Uh, in the north are the towering Alpine ranges, uh, which are perennially snowbound and so offer plenty of rivers and streams to the northern part uh, of, the, of the peninsula. But down the spine of Italy, if you want to think of Italy as the boot, which is certainly the way that I was told, always think of Italy as the boot kicking Sicily, which I think is metaphorically uh, really quite accurate. Um, but uh, down the spine of Italy uh, are the Apennine Mountains. They're, they're not as high as the Alps. They're not permanently snowbound, but they do offer, especially in the wintertime, an abundance of water uh, streams and springs to feed the inhabitants. Uh, the largest rivers in, in Italy, at least the ones that we're going to be most focused on, uh, are three. The Po River in the north, which runs uh, from east to west, uh, sort of from Milan over towards Venice. Um, the Arno River in north-central Italy, uh, which we'll see was one of the borders of the ancient Etruscan homeland. Uh, and then in central Italy, the Tiber River, which is the river upon which Rome was founded. The mountainous nature of Italy also offered the people uh, plenty of wood uh, and pasture land for sheep and goats, which were raised in great profusion, as archaeology makes clear, and still are to this day. Aside from the mountains, uh, there are coastal plain areas uh, in Italy, and three of those are worth looking at. The first one isn't actually coastal, it's the Po Valley. It's the river valley uh, of, of that major river in the north of Italy, which offers a very wide expanse, the widest expanse, in fact, in the country of fertile uh, arable land. But also we'll be looking at the plain of Latium, uh, modern-day Lazio, which is uh, immediately to the south of the settlement of Rome. Uh, and the Latins, in fact, as we'll see, were to receive the close attention of the Romans uh, for several centuries before uh, the rest of the Italians and ultimately the rest of the inhabitants of the Mediterranean did. And uh, south of Italy, uh, sorry, south of Latium, um, around the area of Naples is the plain of Campania. Campania is uh, extremely fertile uh, because it has... Mount Vesuvius located in it. Mount Vesuvius is an active volcano and um, erupted, of course, most spectacularly in recent memory in AD 79, burying the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum, leaving us with great archaeological treasure trove. But it also um, offers the plain of Campania a great agricultural treasure trove of volcanic minerals that makes the place especially fertile. Uh, and uh, because of the slopes of the mountain, was a very popular place for wine growing in the ancient, ancient times. Uh, and as an aside, I'll uh, presage some, some um, later talk about public leisure and so forth by saying that uh, Campania became the equivalent of uh, the Roman aristocracy's Florida. Uh, this is where they went to holiday uh, and, and relax. It's a beautiful environment. I mean, the famous saying, see the Bay of Naples and die. Uh, it's a magnificent um, physical setting. But also there are naturally hot springs and so forth there. And very quickly, the plain of... Uh, Campania and the towns around it became holiday resorts for the Roman uh, well-to-do. As to Latium itself, uh, it's bordered on its northern edge, as I've said, by the river Tiber, uh, on its western side by the Tyrrhenian Sea, uh, and on its east and south by mountains. 
Uh, in the centre of the plain of Latium uh, stand the Alban Hills, a low-lying range of hills which uh, were to be a religious focal point for the people, the early inhabitants of Latium, the Latins. By the time of Roman expansion in Italy, all of these plains and the others I haven't mentioned, all the lowlands of Italy were well uh, worked by agriculturists. Uh, in the mountains tended to reside more pastoral people, uh, but more of that and on. But this was a well settled region by the time the Romans emerged as a power uh, in the area of Italy. What about the people themselves? Well, with the exceptions of the Greek colonizers in the south and the Etruscans in ancient Tuscany, uh, ancient Etruria, modern Tuscany, uh, the Italian peninsula was occupied by non-urbanized tribal peoples. That means these people did not have large cities. Uh, they lived, tended to live in villages, uh, in loose tribal arrangements led by chieftains or clans. Uh, they often would have um, specific sites that they shared for religious purposes, which um, offered something of a focal point for their cultures. But they were uh, very much living what would be termed by archaeologists an Iron Age lifestyle, uh, tribal, non-urbanized lifestyle. Archaeology is clear to us uh, that um, the first in inhabitants of Italy went back to the Stone Age, but the period before about 400 BC is very difficult to reconstruct. Uh, we have uh, fragmentary references by Greeks to the situation in Italy uh, prior to uh, 400, but they're extremely sketchy and, of course, laid over with legends and myth, uh, which makes life very difficult for the historian to try to reconstruct the situation uh, in the era before 400 BC. Our two main avenues into the uh, prehistoric period of Italy are archaeology, unsurprisingly, and linguistics. Archaeology, as we've seen before, is a very valuable tool for the ancient historian, churning up an enormous variety of um, ancient evidence, ancient artifacts which can be studied. And in the prehistoric period, that means really the period before we have any kind of extant or consistent literary or written evidence whatsoever, uh, archaeology is really all we have to work on. And so, as we've already seen, when looking at archaeology, everything then depends on the interpretation of the data. Um, and I suppose it's safe to say that archaeology uh, offers us two main ways of examining and trying to make sense of the cultural patterns of pre-Roman Italy. One is examination of burial styles, whether the people inhumed their dead, buried them whole, uh, or whether they cremated them. And um, often cultures can be determined by uh, whether or not they use cremation or inhumation. And the other main avenue is pottery, pottery styles. Types of pottery, shapes of pots, and decorative techniques on those pots are also used in combination with burial styles and settlement patterns to try and deduce the different classes of people who occupied early Italy. And this course is not about early Italy, so I'm not going to go into tremendous detail about the various types uh, of culture that have been located there. Suffice it to say that uh, now a reasonably good, I think, a reasonably good picture of the situation in pre-Roman Italy, in prehistoric Italy, can be, can be now reconstructed. We, have, we see people in there from the Stone Age. They continue on into the Bronze Age. And around 1000 BC, uh, there's a tremendous growth in the population of the pre-Roman people of Italy. And they start to uh, um, become more profuse. Their settlements become more common. And of course, their burials become more common because there are more people to bury. What about linguistic evidence? Well, linguistic evidence is also uh, uh, very useful. So far, uh, at least 40 languages have been identified uh, that were spoken in pre-Roman Italy. Forty languages are dialects of languages. I think that's per per perhaps more accurate. Languages are dialects, which is quite a lot. Um, these dialects are known to us from f often fragmentary inscriptions that have been found inscribed on stone or on, bit or on, or on pieces of pottery, uh, are in fossils that have been left over in later authors who quote ancient ancient uh, um, uh, formulae that seem to incorporate these ancient languages. The issue is, though, what 
does the historical well, what's the historical significance of the linguistic evidence? What does the plethora of languages and their various classification tell us about the historical processes uh, that determined the population pattern of pre-Roman Italy? That's a, much diff that's a much more difficult question to answer. Are we talking about language groups su supplanting other language groups because of invasion, because of conquest, or because of trade and emulation? Migration, acculturation, what's going on? What's the historical process behind the quilt of pre-Roman Italic languages? That's a matter for debate, and I'll leave that to the experts in the field. I just want to draw your attention to it. As far as we can tell, then, uh, the broad division between the peoples uh, of uh, pre-Roman Italy was that of agriculturalists in the lowlands, and often pastoralists, very warlike usually, people living in the hills or foothills of, um, of the mountains that are so common across the peninsula. Sometime around 600 BC, a major shift took place in the population of Italy uh, in the north. Um, starting, it seems, at about this time, people from across the Alps began to infiltrate into the northern part of Italy. These people were Celts, what the Romans called Gauls, Gallic Celtic people, who, as you may or may not know, were uh, in Northern Europe very dominant Iron Age culture. The, the, the Celts, for what it's worth, uh, seem to have arisen in the area of Austria or originally, and spread westwards, eventually to occupy most of France and parts of Germany, Spain, uh, and eventually they moved up into the British Isles where, of course, they founded the civilization which has given us such wonderful scholars of, of ancient Rome. <laughs> but um, starting around 600 BC, they also began to cross the Alps. And this, this would have been some feat, uh, um, crossing the Alps uh, without there being anything other than goat tracks to follow must have been quite difficult. Um, and exactly again, what's happening? Are these Celtic invasions? Are these large bodies of armed men coming in and taking over the northern part of Italy, the Po Valley? Or are they gradual migrations, filtrations that take place over centuries? Very hard to tell that from the archaeological evidence, which will tend to conflate the evidence, uh, you know, giving you 50 years either side. Well, 50 years is a long time. It's almost two generations of people. What's going on? Uh, very hard to say. What we can say is that by 500 BC, the whole of the Po Valley was occupied by Gallic Celts. In fact, the Romans called it Gallia Cisalpina, which means Gaul this side of the Alps. They classified it as part of the land of the Gauls. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't until much later that it became classified as part of Italy. Italia started south of Gallia Cisalpina. Uh, so the whole northern plain of the Po Valley was considered by the Romans not to be, at least, or, at least or, originally, not to be part of Italy. If we move from north to south, uh, uh, of the, um, in the picture of pre-Roman Italy, we have the Celtic Gauls in the north. Then we have the various Italic tribal cultures, chief among them in central Italy, the Oscans, and especially the Samnites. We'll be hearing more about the Samnites in due course, uh, occupying the area to the south and um, east of Latium. And then in the south of Italy, we have uh, also invaders called Greeks. Well, not quite invaders. They're foreign settlers, people, people from abroad. Um, what are the Greeks doing in Italy? Well, those of you who know your Greek history will be well familiar with the period of Greek colonization that started around 800 BC and continued on to about 600 BC. But the intense period of colonization stretching from about eight, 800 to say 700 BC, the very intense spread of Greeks and their culture across the Mediterranean world. They went east and west, they went up into the Black Sea uh, on, the, on the, the southern steppes of Russia, and they also came westwards as far as Italy. In fact, some of the earliest colonization movements from Greece took place in Italy. And by the time uh, that the Romans began to emerge as a force to be reckoned with in Italy, the Greeks were well established in the southern part of Italy and in Sicily. But a word on Greek colonies and Greek colonization. Greek colonies were not part of any organized, centralized Greek empire or Greek state. They were not instruments of imperium. They were instead city-states each one independent of the other, uh, each one with its own laws and governing bodies, foreign policy and coinage and army and so forth. Uh, and so these Greek colonies should not be seen as 
part of a concerted attempt by Greece to take over Italy or, or anything like that. They are merely a, a pattern of settlement in the southern part of Italy that would have been uh, uh, well established by the time the Romans emerged on the scene. The Greek colonies that we'll be talking about, I suppose, more, most commonly are Naples, Neapolis, the new city, uh, which was uh, founded on the coast of Campania, uh, on the mainland. Tarentum, which is uh, down south, south and east on the southern shore of uh, Sicily, that was uh, of Italy. Sorry, that was to be a very uh, major player in Roman history, and finally, possibly the most powerful Greek city-state anywhere in the Greek world, Syracuse on Sicily. Uh, this was a, a, a majorly powerful state and one to be reckoned with, uh, and one in fact the Romans saw fit first of all to ally themselves with uh, before they um, attempted to take the place over and conquer it. Now, the Greeks are different from the tribal peoples that we've looked at. These are urbanized, highly sophisticated people. Uh, this is, uh, Greek culture is a very influential culture. And the process that uh, describes the adoption of Greek ways of doing things or Greek thought and so forth is Hellenization from the Greek word Hellas, which is how they describe themselves, the Hellenes. Hellenization is the process of people adopting Greek manners. And wherever the Greeks went, uh, people who neighbored them tend to get Hellenized. It tends to be that uh, the, the, the simpler culture will emulate the more sophisticated culture. That, te that seems to be a general anthropological principle. And the Greeks were about as sophisticated as the Mediterranean could get at that time. So the influence of the uh, Greeks should not be underestimated. And it seems that sometime uh, sh around the arrival of the Greeks in South Italy and Sicily, it seems that um, peoples to the north of Rome became very heavily Hellenized. Pre-Roman pre peoples called Villanovans, they're called. It's a strange name. It's, it's the name of the site where the pottery style that defines the culture was found. So they're called Villanovan culture. These people seem to have uh, risen themselves up to civilization and become known to us as the Etruscans. And it's on the Etruscans I wish to focus the last part of this lecture. The Etruscans are often described as mysterious, uh, and in the popular culture they're still presented uh, as being some, somehow mysterious. This view is um, somewhat understandable, but isn't entirely correct. Uh, we have nothing actually from the Etruscans themselves, at least nothing in terms of long literary treatments of, of their own history or their own culture like we do for the Greeks or the Romans. Uh, we have the tales of outsiders about them. We have the tales of the Romans about them. We have the tales of the, of, of the Greeks about them. We have archaeological evidence, which is invaluable. Um, and we also have inscriptions in the Etruscan language. You think, well, goodness, if we have inscriptions, don't we have material from the, from the Etruscans? Well, yes, we do, but the problem is we can't read it. Um, it, it was written in Greek letters, so we can read what the words mean, uh, or at least what they say, we just don't know what they mean. Um, so as a result, uh, bits and pieces of Etruscan inscriptions can be understood, but for the most part, we can't use, use the material to reconstruct a history of the Etruscans in tremendous detail the way we can for the Greeks or the Romans, for instance. On the, on, on the other hand, investigation into the uh, Etruscan world in the last 50 years especially has revealed an awful lot to us about them that now makes it possible to say that they're not really all that mysterious. Uh, there are still questions uh, about, about the Etruscans, about their origins, for instance, that we're going to look at, and also about the nature of their control or their influence in Italy. These are certainly valid historical questions. But what Etruscan society was like, broadly speaking, that I think we can now safely say we can present in a reasonably clear way. The ancient view of the Etruscans was that they were uh, immigrants, migrants from the Eastern Mediterranean. This uh, would certainly explain why their language is so odd, since it bears no resemblance to any of the neighboring languages, any of the neighboring Itali Italic languages uh, of the ancient peoples bordering the Etruscan lands. So naturally enough, one can say, well, if their language is sort of odd, maybe they brought it with them from elsewhere. 
Uh, and for the longest time, it was considered uh, to be the case that uh, the Greeks and the Romans were right, that the Etruscans were uh, uh, foreigners who had migrated from the eastern half of the Mediterranean. Precisely where is unclear, but somewhere in the east, wherever that is, uh, and had settled for some reason uh, in the area of ancient Etruria, which is the area immediately north of Rome, bordered by the Tiber River on the south, uh, the Arno River uh, on, the, on the north, uh, and by um, the Apennine Mountains on the east and the sea on the west. But uh, more recently, a lot of archaeological work has revealed that in all likelihood the Etruscans are native Italian peoples called Villanovans who raised themselves up to uh, urbanize civilization probably under influence, or, well possibly under influence from, from the Greeks. Uh, archaeological evidence shows that under all the Etruscan sites there's a Villanovan site uh, and there's no sign of any discontinuity of settlement uh, invasion, burning lairs or anything like that, for instance, that might suggest uh, that the Etruscans came into a situation aggressively uh, and conquered, as was the old view uh, of, the, of the origins of the Etruscans. So I think we can say relatively safely that on best available current evidence, the Etruscans uh, are a native Italian um, urbanized culture, but under strong Greek influence. That's always important to remember about them. The Etruscans were not a, a unified people politically. Uh, they had city-states. We hear of uh, a league of 12 cities, which seems to have been mutually antagonistic members of this league who often warred with each other but could act in concerted effort uh, if threatened or uh, if much to their advantage. They do seem to have come together for religious purposes, these, these 12 cities. In other words, this is a very common uh, feature of leagues, especially, say, in Greece, where uh, often antagonistic um, uh, warring city-states can come together to celebrate festivals, religious festivals or athletic festivals together. So that's sort of interesting parallel there with the Greeks uh, among the Etruscan cities. The cities themselves appear to have been ruled originally by kings, and again, rather like the Greeks, uh, by the time that the uh, Romans began to encounter them uh, seriously, many of those cities had been uh, um, undergone revolutions. The kings had been overthrown, and they were now ruled by what are termed oligarchies. There's a technical term to impress people at Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, goodness, that's a nice oligarchy you have there. Uh, an oligarchy is a, a, a rule of a few, of a handful of people, determined either by birth or by wealth or, or some other criterion that demarcates the ruling class uh, from the non-ruling class. We, there's no doubt that the Etruscans exercised a tremendous influence over central Italy. But debate uh, has recently been rekindled as to the nature of that influence. And uh, this is a good example of the sorts of interpretative issues that pervade ancient history that, that we talked about in the introductory materials. This is an important question. What was the nature of Etruscan control in, in Italy? It's a very basic question, one that we think that you should be able to answer easily, but actually it turns out to be very difficult. The received view, at least the view that was very common and, and is still very common, is that, is that the Etruscans exercised a strong political control over Italy from the Po Valley south to Campania. That they exercised this primarily uh, on the uh, western seaboard of Italy, but they did also cross the, um, uh, the Apennines and exercise some control in the area of modern-day Umbria. And that this was, if you want to think of it this way, as an empire of the Etruscans, a kingdom of the Etruscans. Now, if you think about the geography that we've just looked at, well, Rome and the Latins will be slap bang in the middle of that empire. And so at some stage, by the logic of this reconstruction, the Romans must have been ruled by the Etruscans. And yes, people have gone and they have found good evidence, strong evidence, that the Romans were indeed at one stage under the thumb of their northern neighbours. And there's talk of an Etruscan period in Roman history. This is a very common view uh, and uh, it has got a, a lot of supporting evidence in its favour. But recently a very stimulating book was published uh, by uh, Tim Cornell um, in England 
the book is called The Beginnings of Rome, and Tim Cornell uh, challenges this view of Etruscan domination in Italy. He points out to inconsistencies in the pattern of Etruscan evidence across the so-called empire. He says, for instance, if we look at the density of inscriptions, so I'll just give you this example. We have lots of, obviously, lots of Etruscan inscriptions pertaining to important people. One didn't carve an inscription for a nobody. One carved an inscription for an important person. Obviously, we have lots of those inscriptions in Etruria itself, north of Rome. Not very many in Latium, and then a lot again in Campania. Why do we have an Etruscan empire with a big hole in the middle? Why are there so many Etruscans north and south of Latium, but not in Latium itself? He also draws parallels with other uh, archaic cultures, uh, looking at the um, nature of uh, the upper classes in these archaic cultures, and how they, are, they often can move around freely among each other, across city-state boundaries. There, there's sort of an aristocratic ethos among many of these early cultures, and he says this does not fit with the notion of, of an Etruscan dominance. His picture of the uh, nature of Etruscan control in central Italy is that of a sphere of influence. He said many of the pieces of evidence that you find for uh, the uh, early Etruscan Empire or the Etruscan Empire in Italy are actually evidence of cultural influence, and that can't be denied. Okay? And so you have in Etruria plenty of Etruscans, and then they move south, passing by Latium, maybe going by the sea, into Campania, where it's actually extremely pleasant, as I mentioned before. And you find plenty of Etruscans down there, but not too many in the area of Latium itself, which was densely populated and would have been a very difficult uh, uh, place to conquer, as we'll see the Romans found out. Very difficult place to move into militarily and take over. So you sort of simply bypass it if you're Etruscan. And also what we're talking about then is not so much an Etruscan empire or an extended Etruscan kingdom, in control of central Italy, but rather a sphere of influence, a sphere of cultural influence, and undoubtedly political influence as well, but not a centralized state, not a centralized empire. Whether or not Tim Cornell's view will ever be uh, accepted in full is a matter for the scholars to figure out over the next, uh, over the, over the next few years. Initial reactions have been mixed. Some people, of course, are horrified to see the notion of Etruscan Rome being, being so uh, uh, um, hastily dismissed. Uh, and so uh, the issue, no, no doubt, will be hotly debated among students of early Rome and, uh, and of the Etruscans uh, for years to come. But it's interesting that there is such a debate and fully illustrative of, of what we talked about in the introductory classes of this course. The sorts of things that people argue about in ancient history. Well, the Etruscans were uh, very thoroughly absorbed by the Romans. This is one of the reasons why they were initially considered to be so mysterious. The Romans, drawing the line between the Etruscan and Roman in so many fields, uh, has proven to be very difficult. The Romans themselves tended to look at their own culture and say, goodness, that's an odd feature of the way we do things. Where did that come from? Oh, the Etruscans gave us that. And we, we don't know if we can trust that statement or not. Uh, the Romans just seem to have thrown it out often as, oh yes, that came from the Etruscans. That's why we have a temple shaped like that. That's why we look at birds to try and divine the nature of, of, of the gods' intent. This is a very strange thing to do, isn't it? You go out and you look at birds feeding, or you look at birds flying. It's called augury. And you, that way you're able to tell something about the gods' disposition towards this or that endeavor that you're planning to take part in. This is something that the Romans themselves say came from the Etruscans. And in fact, the evidence of uh, tomb paintings and so on, archaeological evidence uh, from the Etruscan sites, would suggest that this is not incorrect. That it seems that the Etruscans were keen on this issue of divination, trying to divine closely the attitude of the gods towards uh, human enterprises. The Romans were also greatly influenced by the Etruscans in the field of statecraft, especially the symbols of power. Uh, we'll see those symbols of power when we look at the Roman Republic. But uh, suffice it to say now that many of those symbols, for instance, the fasces, the rods and axes of, of office that accompanied Roman magistrates about them, uh, were derived from the Etruscans. And we'll see as well other influences on the Roman polity, uh, at least on the symbols of power uh, from the Etruscan sources. 
So, pre-Roman Italy then, a quilt of cultures, uh, a great variety of languages, uh, with some foreigners, Greeks and, uh, in the south, Celts in the north, and the whole place, well, not waiting for Rome, but certainly going to experience Rome in no short order in the centuries to come.